and I go all of the reasons. I'm too tired. I have no voice left. Well, that's my excuse. I'm too busy. I don't know anybody who needs the good news. You can put your hand down. Thank you. You see, it's an important question, isn't it? Why haven't we shared? I, my, my favorite excuse, and, and I think the one that gets used, there, there are two that get used in church circles, and you're in a church circle right now, so this, this is kind of relevant. There are some of you out there who have already said, well, it really isn't my gift to do evangelism. Now, that, the people using that excuse are the ones who understand a little bit about spiritual gifts. And usually when we know just a little bit about spiritual gifts, we figure out how we can use them as an excuse for keeping from doing the things God has called us to do. Have you ever used an excuse to not do the things you ought to do? Yeah, me too. I do all the time. You see, we, we say things like, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Or I don't have the gift of compassion, of mercy, or of love. And then everyone who wants to talk about that, or doesn't really want to talk about it, runs and hides. Because they're afraid of the pastor or someone telling them what I'm going to tell you about the gift of evangelism. And this is really important. You need to understand this. There's no such thing as this gift of evangelism. There's only a command. In all of the lists of spiritual gifts, evangelism is not ever mentioned. <laughs> and there's a reason. The reason is that if God has chosen me, and I've come into the presence of God and I've become a Christian, there is one or two commands that is given to each and every follower of Jesus, including go make disciples, go evangelize the world. So now that we've got that excuse taken care of, right, turn to a neighbor and say, well, I can't use that excuse anymore. <laughs> when? <laughs> you know, so now what's keeping from evangelism. Well, that brings me to my next favorite excuse in the church. Here's how it goes. I don't know how. I don't know how. How many of you might use that excuse? I don't know how to do evangelism. Oh, good. Well, I'm assuming that more of you might not know how to do it because if you knew how, you might do it, right? Sometimes just by accident. I think sometimes the best evangelism in the church actually happens by accident. But there are some things that you can do and know that will help you do evangelism if we just know about three things. The first is that you have to be emotionally prepared. That means you have to be excited about your relationship with God. It means you need to be excited about what you know and who you know enough to share it with 
people that you think might need some good news. In other words, if you know somebody who's hurting, or if somebody has lost their job, or if there's someone who has cancer, or if there is a need and you can see it, maybe you have a word of hope for them. And you're excited about it. That's called being emotionally prepared. And sometimes we're not. In fact, I think a lot of times in mainline denominations like ours, we don't get very excited or very emotionally charged up about our faith. Because if we did, it might look different. It might feel different. Wow, it might even really be different. Now, I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I'm not going to do anything. I want you to close your eyes and use your imagination. Pretend that Sheila didn't have to move people to the center aisle. Pretend that every chair in this room was filled with people. Think with me what the music would have sounded like when we sang, this is God's house. The sound people would have had to have turned the PA system up because you need to hear the music. The people next to you would be singing and it would be loud. And by the way, you've learned that song really well. It sounded great up here. There would be excitement. There would be noise that was affiliated with the service. Every time we stood up or raised a hand, you would hear the sound and you would be filled like in a football stadium when the team does something good. When the choir sings, Jesus paid it all. It wouldn't just be a round of applause that they get. It would be maybe a shout of hallelujah or an amen along with, dare I say it, a standing ovation for God's grace in the music. Now here's the good thing about emotion. You can manufacture it. You can manufacture emotion. You can change how you feel. It's your choice. And it starts at about 7.45 on Sunday morning. <coughs> because you all got up at 7.45 and come to church and some of you were like, that's all. God, I've got to go to church again. That's kind of how I was this morning when I got up and tested my voice and nothing came out. We get to choose what our attitude is. Our attitude can be excited. You can come to church saying, oh, the choir is going to sing great today. And the preacher has something for me to hear today. So we need to be emotionally prepared. But we also need to be intellectually prepared. That that means you do have to know some things to share some things. Barb, can you show what, share what you don't know? Nope, can't do it. Can't do it. But if you're a Christian, there are some things you know because you said them when you were baptized. You know that Jesus came. You know that Jesus died. You know that Jesus was resurrected. By the way, that's all you really need to know. All there are other things that will make you better. There will make things that will give you more things to talk about, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you have to be intellectually prepared. Then, thirdly, you need to be relationally prepared. That means if you're going to share the good news, don't beat them over the head with a Bible. It's not effective. It just gives them a headache. And they think the church and God caused it. It's true. I've talked to more people turned off by church people who, you know, I always loved my grandfather's Bible. One of the reasons is it makes 
makes this really a good illustration. Smack you upside the head till you get the gospel. How many people is that going to bring to the church? How many people is that going to send running out the door? Or slamming the door in your face? All of them. That's why the second command that Jesus gave every believer says, love one another. You don't beat people that you love. Whether it be with a Bible or any other weapon. So we have to be prepared. And then, and then we have to really understand that each and every one of us is rich. So I want you to do something for me. I thought about this as Sheila was trying to get you to move closer together. I want you to take your left hand and put it out here like this. And your right hand out here like this. Don't slap the person next to you. Robin, you're in trouble. Right? All right. Now, last week we talked about the bridge. And I want you to understand this image really well. So put your hands up and we're going to come back. Because we have some explaining to do, and I want you to know what you're explaining. And the first thing is, guys, can you move me forward one screen? Thank you. Some reason the remote didn't work. It's all right. There are two sides of life. There are, or there is the side where the people are sinful. Sinful. You and me, all of us. And then, there's this chasm, and then there's God, holy. Now this is the starting spot. All of us started on the left side. All of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, you started on the left side. You started on the left side. <laughs> you did? That's because you're human. Turn to your neighbor and make sure they're human. <laughs> we all started in the same place. Now, we call this the original condition. And the divide is said. The result is despair, hopelessness, and lostness. We are separated from God. And here's one of the really important things it's a choice. We choose to be separated from God. Now moving into the second, next screen, guys. There is no bridge that reaches God except <coughs> one. Now in the world, in the world, we try to make the jump to God. We try to step over the chasm. We try to build our own. And sometimes we see it done with good works. How many of you have ever heard at a funeral, oh, he was a good man? And you know what that means. It means he never darkened the door of the church. He might not have ever said anything good about God. But he did good things. Sometimes, even in the church, we try to get across the divide by being so religious. You know, the people who never miss, but never change. Some of us try to get across my philosophy. You know, that, that was the whole idea behind the God is dead philosophy in the 60s and 70s. Morality, I'm going to be good enough to get into heaven. And 
and then the one that I couldn't get on the screen. This one. I'm going to buy my way in. Because we, in America, we can buy anything. But notice, no matter what we do, the chasm is still there. The gap is still there. Guys, move me forward one more. The only solution is provided by God. The only solution is based on a choice that each one of us has to make. The only choice to move from here to here is to walk across the bridge, which is Christ crucified and resurrected. Now, we don't talk about that very much. But that's the important piece of the puzzle. My salvation depends on Christ. Your salvation depends on Christ. Your neighbor's salvation depends on Christ. Okay. You see, this is the bridge. And I'm really sorry that Roz isn't here because there's something that moves us to the next spot, to the next slide, guys. The question becomes, where are you? Which side of the bridge are you on? Now, if you're a Christian, you're going to say, well, I'm over here. And that's good news. If you're not a Christian, you can become one. All you have to do is cross the bridge. It isn't an intellectual game. It isn't a hard step, necessarily. But it's a choice. But most of us in this room are already over here. So why am I preaching this message? Because Roz Davis understands something very important. She says it when she presides at the Lord's table very often, and I steal it from her every chance I get. Because there are people in your life, maybe your spouse, maybe your child, maybe your neighbor, maybe somebody you work with or go to school with, that you are the only Jesus, they will ever know. Which means that you are standing in the gap for them. And so when I have you put your hand out to the right, go ahead, and I have you put your hand out to the left, you see, you're now in the middle. And it is your job, your task, your responsibility as a follower of Jesus Christ to do this. Come over here. Okay. You see, my friends, a wonderful illustration and I want you to steal it. I want you to use it as you think about your friends and neighbors who need the good news. The challenge is will you share your bridge? You know the lies. We know the house. I'm not sure what else there is. Will you be the bridge? Will you stand there in the gap for the people? 